guys, Mr. Klein here with our first video on MSPS 1-1 for all of you keeping score at home with the next generation science standards. We're going to be talking about atoms and molecules. And yeah, we usually when we think of chemistry, we think about things like awesome chemical reactions and explosions. But in order to get down to the nitty gritty, in order to understand these things like, you know, the awesome chemical reactions. Like, come on, dude. Give me, give me chemical reactions. There you go. Or even the explosions you see. We have to understand what the actual constituent parts are of matter. And that's what we're going to be doing in this video. So let's go ahead and let's get going. The little bits of matter that the physical objects are made of. In other words, the physical universe. Remember, when we talk about science, we're only talking about the physical universe. All the stuff that the physical universe is made of is called the atom. Okay, They're all called atoms. And the definition of an atom that we're going to use here is the atom is the smallest unit of matter. In other words, if you break down matter into its teeniest, tiniest part that has like the properties of what we think it is, it's an atom. And But then we can go into smaller constituent parts. Well, you get into that more in high school. Now, one of the most important topics in scientific history was actually what an atom was and what the atom was made of. And we went from like little marbles to what we have today in this model, which is called the electron cloud model. This is a model of a helium atom. Uh, we have those red little balls, those purple little balls, and we got this, this cloud kind of thing. And so we need to define what those things are. Scientists now know that the atoms are made of smaller particles. Okay, so the red spheres would be like our positively charged particles called protons. And then we have neutrons. Those are particles with no charge. Those were like the purple ones. And they're kind of stuck together in the center of the atom known as the nucleus. And then the nucleus itself is surrounded by this cloud of electrons. Electrons are negatively charged particles, and they kind of have an erratic orbit. You kind of, It's kind of hard to figure out where exactly an electron is at any given time. So we kind of call it a cloud because it's probably going to be there, but we're not quite sure exactly where it's at. And these atoms and these electrons just orbit the nucleus of your atoms. And so no matter what kind of atom you have, whether it's plutonium or iridium or neon or argon or iron or oxygen or carbon or hydrogen or any of that, all atoms in the universe have this configuration. The only difference between an atom of an oxygen and an atom of iron is actually just the number of protons in the nucleus. If you just keep on adding protons, uh, you keep on changing the fundamental nature of the atom itself, which gives you all sorts of properties, which you'll learn about more uh, as you go further into s uh, science about this. So let's go ahead and let's start our graphic organizer. And we have this circle. We have an atom. That's our first concept. It's the smallest unit of matter. And go ahead and you write this down. And as we move on to this next section, we're going to look at what actually happens whenever you start mashing together atoms to form other things. So now that you have that written down, let's talk about what happens whenever we actually put atoms together. Now, while the atom is kind of like the fundamental building block of the universe, almost all atoms in the universe actually don't exist alone. What happens is they're usually stuck together with other atoms. And when two or more atoms combine chemically, they form what is called a molecule. So most matter in the universe exists as a molecule in one way or the other. And they have to combine chemically, which when we talk about chemical reactions, we'll discuss this uh, later on. But like chemicals actually have to bond together. So it's a molecule is informed if you just have two atoms sitting next to each other. Rather, what you need is for the atoms actually bond chemically. Now, depending on the type of atoms involved in creating them, molecules can range in all sorts of sizes. For example, molecules can range from two atoms, like oxygen, that's two O2, that's two oxygen atoms bonded together to hundreds of them in complicated proteins that power our body's functions. Okay, and molecules are extremely important, and which we'll talk about in a second, but why don't I just show you like a couple of molecules? I mean, for example, here's water, you know, three atoms, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom, they're bonded together chemically to form that. 
And then this complicated molecule, which by the way, all those hexagons are actually like carbon atoms and stuff bonding together. This is actually bakelite, which is the earliest form of plastic. This right here is a single molecule, except that we're putting it in a, a structure of them as opposed to showing the individual atoms like in the last one. So they can get pretty complicated. Now, molecules are extremely important and many critical things that we need to survive are made of molecules. Like for instance, water, as you just saw, two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom bonded chemically, or the oxygen that we breathe in the air. Like I said earlier was that oxygen is two oxygen atoms bonded together chemically because they atom molecules like being like nice and stable and molecules are when atoms are all like cuddled together happy and things like that which you'll talk about more whenever you talk about atomic bonding so enough about that stuff let's go ahead and let's fill out the next part of our organizer so atoms are completely related to molecules because molecules are two or more atoms combined chemically okay and what we're going to do in the rest of this lesson is we're going to talk about molecules in a solid state of matter liquid and gases will come later but right now we're going to be talking about just solids and we'll talk about the forms that solids make based on how the molecules arrange themselves so molecules make a major factor in the shape that solids actually form and the way the molecules actually arrange themselves whenever a solid is formed now generally speaking molecules and how they align or arrange themselves when a solid is formed, that's how we define the different types of solids, okay? I'm not gonna get into the really complicated ones, we're just going into two very basic types. So the first type is when solids form and the molecules set into place without any arranged order is what we call an amorphous solid. Amorphous solids are pretty easy to figure out, uh, they tend to not have like a fixed melting point. They just kind of melt. You kind of hit them and they break into all sorts of pieces that you kind of got to fit them together like a puzzle. That's two quick properties of amorphous solids. Probably the easiest one I can talk about is sweet, delicious chocolate. Chocolate, you know, if you get a chocolate bar and you like put it in your hand, it starts getting like all gooey and melty. That's because the molecules that make up chocolate actually don't arrange themselves super duper in a perfect order. They just kind of layer themselves and lay there and there's no fixed structure to them. So when it breaks, it kind of falls over. And because of that structure isn't there, it makes it really easy for it to melt. I mean, after all, if you ever left a chocolate bar in the, in the sun during the summertime, I mean, it's more like a chocolate syrup. Anyway, but whenever you have the atoms and the molecules arranged in an order that repeats itself in a very regular order and they all kind of form a nice great structure, that's what we call a crystal. And that's where we're going with the rest of this lesson. Amorphous solids, you just need to know about the fact that they, uh, they don't really have that arrangement, but crystals are actually pretty interesting. Okay, ice is a really good example of a crystalline solid. It forms what we call a lattice. They, it, that's a, that actual arrangement. And it repeats itself throughout the structure. So let's go ahead and let's finish our graphic organizer since we talked about the molecules and solids. So the first one on the right-hand side is an amorphous solid. It's solids with molecules without an arranged order. Okay, and that's the difference between our two main types of molecules we want to talk about. Either they form amorphous solids or crystalline solids. So amorphous solids, like I said, they don't have an arranged order, and crystals have the arranged order. So they form that regular repeating pattern. So go ahead and finish filling out your organizer right here, and we're going to go on talking. Now, crystals have several specific properties, such as an exact melting point. After all, Water melts uh, from ice to liquid water at zero degrees Celsius. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And as well as the fact that the crystal maintains the crystal shape even as they grow into larger structures, which means even when they break, they still show the arrangement of the crystal structure itself. So in other words, because it repeats itself, no matter how big or how small the, the crystal object is, unless you do specific cutting to it, it's going to keep that arrangement. And so probably the best example of crystal is actually a diamond. It's one large crystal made out of carbon. And this is the Hope Diamond right here, which is probably the most famous colored diamond ever. And while you have all of these nice cuttings and your angles and stuff, 
The actual crystal itself of carbon, this is actually its arrangement. We can generally think of dim uh, diamonds and other crystals in terms of like this molecular structure. Generally, you see it in the form of a cube. And so this is the structure it holds. As you can see, it's very self-supporting, which means that diamonds are really, really strong. So we're going to go into a little bit more about this structure and how it's made in our next section. Okay, so now that we've kind of defined what a crystal is and how it has this structure, we need to actually talk about how crystals are structured. Okay, so all crystals are defined by how the structure of molecules repeats itself throughout the substance. So what happens is when molecules come together in a structure, they fall into line based on a whole bunch of different factors. And they arrange themselves in a way that the structure can easily continue itself. Much like how Lego bricks will easily fit into place. Like if you're building a wall, you just keep on stacking them up. Or you can interlock them. No but no matter how you do it, if you want it to stay like really, really strong, you repeat the structure as you go on. And this structure extends itself from two molecules linked together all the way to large samples. Like for example, chunks of halite, which is rock salt, that show flat sides when you hit them with a hammer. So if we look at this, this is actually salt, okay? And the way the structure is, you see the, the sodium and chlorine atoms. That's they, They're they arranged together in a way where they kind of lock together. Okay, so like the green would be sodium and the chlorine would be purple. And because what they do is they lock into place like Lego bricks, this structure continues itself. It keeps on filling in the gaps when the molecules get there. So as, as it turns from a liquid to a solid, as it cools down, the molecules come into place and kind of lock themselves in like this, which gives it that structure. So this even comes out in the big area, which this is fool's gold or pyrite. And the crystalline structure is a little bit messed up, because it kind of shows itself forming the structures at odd angles, but you can see that the structure forms itself into a cube. Okay, nice and flat. So, and you can see where the angles are. So wherever it breaks off, that's where like the molecules of this mineral kind of end. And so it's just going to continue itself as big as the crystal is. I, if I'm not mistaken, the actual largest single crystal we've had is about mm, 60 centimeters or about two feet and length and it's a single crystal and we can get way more complicated because you know crystals can form things at certain angles and things like that but just for our purposes remember that when a liquid cools down into a solid the molecules arrange themselves in a very particular order much like a lego brick and much like how useful lego bricks are we're going to talk about how we use crystals in the next section Okay, so crystals are really, really useful because of their repeating structure. And because of that repeating structure, it keeps its shape no matter its size. So crystals are really important to scientists and engineers, and we can use crystals in many different ways. Okay, so for example, so, uh, circuit boards and lenses for various types of lasers can be used for them because it keeps its structure. We can use, they can be really, really clear, which allows us to use them for moderating lasers. And also you can grow circuit boards and stuff like that. So scientists and engineers can actually artificially grow crystals because you just give the crystals a place to, you give the molecules a place for them to lock into place like a, a seed, if you will, and from there it'll grow out there. One of the big and interesting things about crystals is actually biologists use them a lot to actually grow protein crystals, which those are, proteins are really, really big molecules that we use in our body and our processes. And what happens is they'll grow these huge crystals of these proteins, and they'll use them to understand how the actual proteins work in our bodies and things like that. Because we can use them in order to create medicines, in order to fight illnesses, as well as understanding how the processes work in our body. So here's a couple examples. Here's one is uh, lasers, you know, because mm, robotic lasers. I mean, who wouldn't want a, a giant robot walking thing that has a laser that can pop balloons? I mean, at least I would. But anyway, these are then this right here is actually a, a scientific... Uh, what they did was they, they took an image of proteins and water molecules. And the water molecules are kind of like the red crosses. And you can see that the proteins are the ones with the lime green and stuff. And these are the actual structures of the proteins, which you see that hexagonal shape 
keep on forming itself and repeating. Now, you do have a pentagon there, but that's a different type of protein building itself. But as you can see, it's building there at the angles. So let's go ahead and let's finally wrap up this lesson. Okay, so we talked about atoms and molecules. Remember that the atom is the smallest unit of matter. And whenever we combine atoms chemically, so they don't just sit next to each other, they bond chemically, we form molecules. Now, in the case of solids, we have to look at molecules and how they arrange themselves when the liquid cools into a solid. If there's no real order to them, we call them amorphous solids. Chocolate is a really good example of that. But if they do arrange themselves in an orderly fashion and this uh, order keeps on repeating itself throughout the structure of the solid, we have what's called a crystal. Okay, with solids with molecules in arranged order. It, things like diamonds, ice, uh, ice water, uh, rock salt, and uh, things, even sugar are all examples of crystals. And we can use them a lot as scientists and engineers in order to understand more about the world and also solve problems uh, that we can use with science as engineers. So there you go. That's your lesson. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And if, as always, you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching.